Thank you very much. That was very kind. And uh, thank you to the organisers. They've actually shown me nearly everything in Oxford today, I should say. Uh, and everything is the oldest ever in the world. Everything. <laughs> very interesting. Many of the changes affecting our societies today are described in terms of cross-border technological changes. We associate them with concepts such as globalization and digitization. And most of the speeches uh, I've heard on the subject consider this reshaping of our world uh, to be only positive, full of hope. And of course, there is every reason to be optimistic. We have technological platforms that facilitate global contact between people. We have new market conditions for business and greater opportunities to keep up with all the developments taking place in our world. We know more, we can reach one another and we can trade in a way never before possible. At least uh, that is the case for those with the greatest ability to benefit from the latest technological advances. People who live in freedom have never been as free as they are now. And with this comes greater opportunities to carry out exciting life projects. At the same time, the gap is widening to those who do not live in freedom. It is also more likely that those without freedom are more aware than before of their own lack of freedom. The freedom of others creates hope and a yearning for a different life. It puts pressure on change in many countries and societies that are poorly prepared to satisfy these desire for freedom. We have seen an Arab spring that has faded into harsh winter. We are seeing greater repression of dissidents in China and in Russia. We will see much clearer calls for freedom and reforms from a rapidly growing young population all over Africa. The forces working against our current global expansion of freedom and openness are now fully mobilized. In some cases, they are defending their own positions of power. In others, they want to establish power over others in order to shut down openness. They believe in the use of violence to achieve their aims, and they often distort religious ideas in order to suppress freedom. Compared with established mixed societies, they consider strictly controlled tributary states that are segregated along ethnic and religious lines to be a better alternative. They are not interested in the consequences this may have for the individual. Their only concern is their own power, often driven by hate and religious conviction. As people's hope of freedom comes up against this totalitarian will, it can only result in increased migration in our time. And this is only the beginning of a new age of migration. Migrants are drawn by the promise of a better future and a desire for freedom and security. Much of this will result in migration to Europe, which cannot respond by building fences. Important values are at stake. Are we, who believe in openness, mixed societies and the peaceful coexistence of people with different religious and political beliefs ultimately to be the victors? Or are those people and groups who believe in control, force of arms, the division of people and strong leaders to determine our future? I believe that openness and freedom ultimately will win the day because they offer better functioning societies for all. However, this requires open societies to combine opportunities for freedom with reforms that create the conditions for more people to find jobs. There is no challenge greater or more difficult than this. We cannot rely forever on the efforts of the military and the police to fight off the willingness 
of extremists who threaten and maim the fellow humans. Violence breeds violence, even if the use of violence may be considered legitimate. Our long-term response must be to build a society that is capable of creating jobs for all. This is the most essential tool for including people and aiding their own development. It is through work that we develop as people and are able to achieve a greater degree of independence. In our most successful developed countries, there have never been more jobs than there are now. At the same time, the pace of change in the economy is increasing. As a result of global competition and continued automation and the increasingly clear digitization of our economy. Many new jobs are being created while many others are disappearing. Those who believe that security means going to the same job and doing the same work decade after decade will encounter more obvious difficulties in making this work. The new situation on the labour market creates three difficult challenges. Firstly, significantly greater value is being placed on experience. This means that people who already have a job are the most likely to be considered for a new one. People who are already in work have a better understanding of developments on the labour market. This creates significant obstacles for those who have never worked, or at least have not done so for a long period. This includes a lot of younger people, of course, but it's also many people who come from other countries at a time of mass migration. For those arriving in a new land, previous work experiences also tends to be valued less. Secondly, the considerable pressure of change risks putting people outside the labour market, despite the fact that they have many years of work experience with little opportunity to return. It is difficult for many middle-aged people to go back to school, particularly where it is unclear whether the training will actually make any difference to their job prospects. The capacity for change is poorly developed in many countries and often encounters resistance from those who have to change their work identity. Thirdly, there is a rapid shift taking place in the perception of skills in terms of education and ability in order to be considered for the new jobs that are developing. This fails to take into the account the fact that these ever greater requirements are in reality impossible to achieve for large sections of the population. The result is an elitist labour market that serves only the best educated and well established in society. The overall effect will be the growth of many new jobs for which increasing proportions of the population in our most developed countries are nowhere near being considered. Many of the jobs that previously represented a first step on the ladder or an opportunity to look for an opening when other doors have closed, have now vanished. While others look set to disappear in the future as automation and digitization increase. Many people's only answer is to highlight the need for further education. This is certainly important. And for money is the missing element. But as a sole solution, it is entirely inadequate. The labour market is developing in such a way and at such a pace that the problem cannot be solved simply through further education. An overall framework is needed in order to create more jobs in Europe. I spoke at the London School of Economics a few weeks ago where I presented a work first initiative, a framework of 12 elements for more people to be able to find a job. This is based on the experiences we gained in Sweden during the eight year 
when I was Prime Minister, but we also examined other successful economies like Germany and the UK, where new jobs are created in our time, there are clear policy differences to those countries that are less successful. There are some important conclusions. All countries need an economy built on strong foundations. Countries with well-managed public finances benefit from a growing willingness to invest. Countries that have price stability under control often have better functioning wage structures, something that is fundamental to the creation of a competitive economy and jobs that develop under healthy economic conditions. The prevailing response around Europe is that jobs are created through increased publicly financed consumption. This conclusion is highly doubtful. Investments in the private sector are much more important and when they take place, they often drive the development of a unilateral growth in highly qualified jobs, as I have described. The use of tax revenues to create jobs is often nowhere near as effective as is claimed in the press conferences at which initiatives are presented. And the public finances of most countries in Europe are currently in such a poor state that any spare capacity has already been used up. The initiative I presented adds three very important dimensions to the often stated view that everything is just about the demand situation in the economy. Firstly, my initiative is based on the individual. It asks questions about an individual's employability and impetus to find work. It affirms the often overlooked fact that the extent to which it is worth working has a major bearing on people's efforts to get a job. Bringing everyone into view also explodes the myth that all those who do not do any work, who do not work as much as they could, are covered by the term unemployed. It clearly demonstrates that there are many, I say many, more people than this, and that this in turn leads us to solutions that reach out to people who are outside the labour market. People who are living in a parallel shadow society risk forming a breeding ground for turning against the open society that has overlooked them. We have simply not tried hard enough to find an answer to the question of how those who have been out of work for a long time are able to find a job. <coughs> Secondly, the initiative is based on measures to stimulate supply. It is the overall supply in an economy that determines how many jobs are created. This is the reason why there are more jobs in countries with larger populations. There are more people working in Britain than in Sweden if we simply count the number of people employed. It is all about increasing the opportunities and impetus to work for everyone at all stages of life. Young people are encouraged to enter the labour market earlier by stimulating part-time jobs and summer jobs or by removing obstacles that prevent young people from getting their first full-time job. People who are at an age when they want to start a family and most importantly, women are encouraged to combine starting a family and bringing up children with continuing to work, work that opens the door to good wage progression, which often means a full-time job. For this to work, we must have good preschools and childcare provisions at low cost. Older people are encouraged to extend their working life by means of special tax rebates. The third aspect is a belief that work in itself has an intrinsic value in terms of developing all people, and thus society, towards greater tolerance and trust between people. The importance of having your own job is so great that it can excuse and necessitate reforms that place greater demands on the individual to be more active in looking for work 
and to always accept jobs that are offered. It is vital that reforms are implemented to make it easier for people to enter the labour market despite the claims that this threatens some of those who already have jobs. In Sweden, we mainly use large tax rebates and subsidies to increase the employability of those who had been outside the labour market for a long time. Ultimately, our success is determined by everyone getting a job. Through different jobs being created and through employers becoming more inclined to employ or provide opportunities for work to people who do not at first appear to be the perfect workforce. Our experience of reforms has taught us what the alternative is. Without a cohesive framework to bring into view all those outside the labour market and to increase their employability, the economic and technological reality of today points to a very different development. This sees the growth of a large and promising labour market with lots of qualified jobs offering high salaries and a good standard of living. An increasing number of people will find it difficult to enter this labour market and to remain there later in life. A large number of more basic jobs also appear, service jobs which partially support all those who meet the entry requirements for the new qualified jobs. The service jobs are needed and provide an alternative for a lot of people. In many countries, however, the conditions are debatable and many of these jobs are at a risk of being rationalised away as digitization becomes more extensive and automation increases in the economy. A third group of people, which is increasing in size, never enter the labour market or, if they leave it, never return. The questions we have to ask ourselves are those. Are we going to accept living in the society that I have just described? Is that a good society? Ask yourself what happens in a society where a growing proportion of the population sees obstacles within society that exclude them from the possibility of having their own job. What use is a long life if you cannot get a job? What will all those people think about society? This is our biggest challenge. Our answer will determine whether humanity's journey towards greater openness in inclusive societies continues or whether the opposing forces gain ground and begin to close down and restrict freedom. Thank you. So, Mr. Rockefeller, first of all, thank you very much for your speech, and indeed, thank you for being here. It's a great honor to have you here. Now, I'd like to first touch briefly, we've been discussing now labor markets a lot. I'd like to touch as well on migration, and also Swedish migration especially. Now, Sweden has been in the headlines for the last few weeks um, due to what has been referred to as the migration crisis, and also Sweden's capacity to deal with it. Now, you yourself are quite famously a proponent of uh, liberal policies and also um, open borders, for example, which you expressed quite famously in a speech more than a year ago. We urged the, open pe the Swedish people to open their hearts. Now, would you say that knowing what you know today about the development of the Sy Syrian civil war and also about Sweden's short-term capacity to deal with migration, would you still have endorsed the same policies as you did back then? And secondly, do you think that the current social democratic government have been right in opting now for a more restrictive migration policy? Well, um, first of all, first question you must ask yourself, which is the better society, as I mentioned? Is the better society a mixed society where people could be different to each other, where people could come from different 
religious and ethnical backgrounds. And I believe that the strongest, best societies that we have on Earth are the mixed societies. They are better societies, and we should stand up for these societies. Because otherwise you believe that we should start to uh, bring ethnic groups aside and put division between world religions. And I think that's the wrong path. And I think you stand to risk of not only talking about migration crisis, but also end up in these kind of notions that you do not or you uh, work, work against these open societies. So that's my first notion. Uh, my second in, is then, if you believe in these open societies, how many can you actually um, take in over just a short span of time? Yes. Well, that could be discussed. Um, I think that uh, we still have capacity in Europe to uh, take in a lot more people than has come to, to Europe. It's a little bit odd that we had a special meeting with uh, the president of Turkey and gave him a lot of um, money um, to keep 2.4 million uh, Syrians in Turkey um, alone. And we are nowhere near the 28 countries in Europe uh, uh, together, uh, nowhere near the figures just seen in Turkey. So to say that there cannot be uh, more people coming is a little bit odd, I think. I also base that on historical experience in Sweden. We have for generations seen people linked to world conflicts coming to Sweden. 1% of the Swedish population is of origin Iraqi. 1% is Iranian. A large portion of Chileans, Syrians, um, Finns, uh, people coming from nearly all parts of the world is the Sweden of today. The last time we had high figures of people coming into Sweden was in 1992. And we had the same discussion. What, what happened then? It was the war on the Balkans. And a lot of them came to Sweden. And people said, it's enough. We can't take them in. There are too many. If you go around now in Sweden, because they came in, they learned Swedish, they started working, they are part of the strong Swedish society. Go around Sweden and try to find anyone saying they were too many today. And you will find they were well integrated. Just give people time, people have abilities and capacity to change. That's why I think that we should try to do uh, more. But I respect the fact that you could uh, end up with with numbers where you actually can't provide them schools or uh, lodging, absolutely, and we have this discussion, but it's done now in the wrong way. It starts with that discussion without asking the question of the open societies and relating to our experience. Uh, and that's, uh, I think, shouldn't uh, be forgotten. To say that it should be uh, pushed through all the European countries is a little bit difficult because it's human beings we are talking about. A lot of the ones coming from Syria have relatives and people in Sweden that they know, and they believe that countries like Germany, Sweden, a few others, uh, are good societies that will provide for them. And I think in other parts of Europe, they have the feeling they will not be well treated. And I think they should also be respected when they make their individual choices. I'm very reluctant to comment uh, the government coming after me because I had eight years in, in government and. It's easier to criticize what I did than to criticize the one that came after me because that's so typical. Uh, you solve everything once you're out of power. Um, so I'm not trying to make any cheap points here tonight. Um, I understand that there is a stress in Europe, but I want to mention one more thing. We talk a lot about Syria, but look around Europe. Dysfunctional states is now to a high extent throughout neighboring Europe not only Syria, Iraq is not functioning, Afghanistan is not functioning, Libya is not functioning. The numbers of dysfunctional states neighboring Europe is increasing and people will start to move to come out of chaos. You would have done the same if you would have experienced the same thing as they are. Certainly. Thank you very much. And also now touching, this, this is a notion that's been recurring about the open society. Um, it seems that your chief opponents in this, according to you, are in Sweden at least, the so-called Sweden Democrats, who are an extreme right party in Sweden. Now, there was a poll released today, this morning, where they, it, it seems that they have increased to about 20% of the, 
approval rating in Sweden from, uh, I might be wrong on the numbers here, but I think from 5% a, a few years ago, three, four years ago. Um, now, the chief strategy for, for your previous government and also for your party and also for all other, other parties in Sweden currently has been not to cooperate with the Sweden Democrats at basically any cost. Now, do you think that this is still the strategy to go, and do you think it's a viable option if they keep growing? Do you think it's worth it in this case? Well, it's not for me to make that decision anymore. Um, I said that, well, the problem is that you see them all through uh, Europe now, the xenophobic right-wingers, um, and they are also increasing in Sweden in this opinion poll, mainly because the main issue in Sweden for many months now have been immigration. Um, and as long as that's the main uh, issue of, of politics and not the one that we should discuss, jobs, economy, uh, because whatever you think about it, migration, it will end up in a discussion, can we create jobs and an inclusive society? It, it, it will not be police and military and everything else we are discussing now. It will be, can we create an inclusive society where p people will get a job and better life circumstances? That is what we need to achieve. I think that um, the problem, of course, for me, was that uh, what are they trying to tell the Swedish people? They are trying to say that we, it's time to close the open society, that there are division between people, that there should be um, kept aside people from different religions. I can't compromise with that that is going uh, directly at the heart of the idea of an open society. I, I think it's as bad when they say that as when I hear American presidential candidates saying we, we could allow people to come into the United States from Syria, but only the Christians. As if we are now dividing our world uh, alongside the world religions, what, do we, what, what kind of world do you think will emerge from these kind of thinking? What will happen with Muslim groups that look at Europe, look at the world in the West, if that is our signal. Um, I've been trying to say this also in Sweden. You should remember we are nearly 10 million now in Sweden because we are one of the few countries in Europe that are actually growing in population linked to migration. Um, half a million of the Swedes are Muslims. Half a million. So we already have the world religions in Sweden. We can't go around saying, well, we'll only admit the Christians. Uh, that is as if we are trying to create a kind of tribal war between religions in our time that would be extremely dangerous. Very quickly to follow up on that, uh, just to clarify, I understand that you don't want to comment on what ought to be done, but then do you think that it, it is a viable strategy independent uh, of let's say, ideological notions, just politically viable not to cooperate with the Sweden Democrats at any cost if they keep growing to 25%, let's say. Well, that's speculating. Uh, All right. I haven't seen it. Uh, I've, we've been discussing xenophobic right-wing parties since the rise of the FPÖ in Austria in the 80s, um, and I haven't seen any solution to bring them down um, that has worked. As long as people get nervous and uh, if we lose trust between people, if we think that we should close down the open society, if that's the talk of the town, these kind of political forces will gain momentum. And that is what happens. So for me, no, I can't adjust to that. I must stand up against that to form a kind of other view on society for those who believe more in an open society than they do. Before we turn to questions from the floor, I hope to ask a couple of questions, uh, comparative questions between British and Swedish politics. You mentioned uh, the party in Sweden, Sweden Democrats, who arguably are a threat to the open society. You have a, a party in this country, UKIP, which is also arguably a threat in the British context, the open society. How similar do you think the Sweden Democrats and UKIP are? Well, uh, there is a difference in, in historical background because everyone knows that the Sweden Democrats in Sweden has a clear white power back background uh, very far right in the 90s. Uh, these were the skinheads going back, uh, the real uh, neo-Nazis longer back in time. Uh, they have now shifted away from that and uh, they want to have portray themselves differently. Um, but that's the background and everyone knows that in Sweden. 
uh, and I think a lot of others uh, are more uh, populist, so to speak, not as clear coming out of this white power uh, movement. And that is uh, also true for UKIP, but also they reflect very much on migration as a main issue. Um, and uh, so, of course, uh, there is a great difference between our, our systems in that they were, I think they only got one seat in House of Commons. They did indeed. Uh, yeah. uh, they lost a seat, in fact. And they lost a seat, actually, yeah. which is, of course, linked to, to, the, uh, to the majority voting system you have in Britain which is uh, different from Sweden. So uh, they've grown now uh, much clearer in, in Sweden since we have a proportional um, election system. A key similarity, however, seems to be their stance towards immigration and their, their concern with the free movement of peoples in the EU. If the Sweden Democrats were continue, well, if they were to continue to rise in popularity and if Brexit seems more, more probable as we get closer and closer towards a referendum, do you think the outcome will be um, a potential restriction by the EU of the free movement of peoples to maintain support for the EU at large? Do you think that there might be, if you like, a, a threat of Swexit if, um, if you continue to see the rise of the Swedish Democrats? So what do you think the outcome will be? Well, everything can happen in a democracy because it depends on where people will put their vote. The Sweden Democrats is, are, are clearly against European Union. Um, it's, it's quite interesting that it's on the far left and the far right that you will find the people against European Union and Sweden. Uh, the most pro are actually uh, the Sweden Conservative Party, could be reminded to people in Britain. Uh, quite interesting. Um, uh, I think that um, um, we are affected very much by the decision to be taken in the United Kingdom. Um, we are very like-minded, United Kingdom and Sweden. Uh, we are very pro-trade, open markets. Um, we are very similar in the view of budget restrictions inside European Union. We have worked very closely together, the British and the Swedish government, through my years in, in, as Prime Minister. Um, if we were to lose the uh, United Kingdom and the European Union, this will definitely be an enormous drawback also for Sweden. Um, because we are also two of the countries that for a long time, maybe for for the future, as we can see it, will be outside of the euro because the Swedes have decided not to join the euro and the UK has said that you do not want to leave the British pound. So uh, in, a, in a European Union where we have both Sweden, United Kingdom, probably also Denmark, maybe a few others, then there will be an acceptance that there is a division, division between those who have euro and those who have not. But if UK leaves, it would be very tough for Sweden to say, hey, let's respect little Sweden here um, without the euro. Um, I think that will be um, uh, quite problematic. So uh, we will do whatever we can to call our relatives in Britain and try you to keep you in. It will also be tough if a Eurosceptic party, as you say, is polling at 20%, as Paul, sa as Paul says. Uh, we're now going to turn to questions from the audience. If you'd like to ask one, just put your hand in the air, please, and wait for the microphone to be passed around by our committee. Uh, the lady in the second row in this front section here. So as we have said, we've recently seen a massive um, reversal in Sweden's migration policy, um, which has come to, as a shock to many because this, th this proposal hasn't been seriously debated by anyone other than the nationalist party before. And so my question, well, my questions um, are, why do you think a pragmatic debate on this subject has been so difficult to initiate? And second, is the Swedish political climate inherently prone to be um, polarized in this way? Well, I think this uh, situation in Europe that is polarizing all countries, um, there are coming many people and um, it's very hard to see a, a ceasefire and stop of the killing in Syria. And as I said, there is a row of other countries. We should remember that two weeks ago, um, the main country of origin for people coming to Sweden is not Syria, but Afghanistan. So just saying close down from Syria, is, is, that's not uh, the full proportion of what we are looking at. We also have a serious dysfunctional deepening of the problems in Afghanistan. Um, so, of course, I respect that 
looking at this week after week, we get nervous. We think that uh, the, the school quality will go down. There will be difficulties to, to actually take these people on. But I think we should also remember uh, the demographics of Europe. Uh, we have a, s a quickly growing world population, except for Europe. And in Europe, we have an aging population in love with its welfare systems. And we are living longer lives after leaving uh, working ages, somewhere around 60, 65, probably higher in the future. And we want to have our pensions, we want to have our social security and our health care. And every expert I've spoken to have pointed at the same problem. You need to increase the portion of people in the age of working. What is Europe doing? Well, not enough. We have this problem in, throughout Europe. We will have actually lack of uh, uh, labor in many countries when we look ahead 10 or 15 years. So they say you should seek for people midlife that wants a job. That's what Europe needs to do. And on the borders of Europe, you now have thousands of people who want to come that are in the age of working, and we say, what can we do to keep them out? So I understand that we get nervous. I understand that this is uh, something hard to deal with in a week or um, a month. But if you think a little bit deeper, if you think a little bit about the demographical changes, the reshaping of the structure, you should know that the only age group that will increase in numbers in Sweden the coming 30 years are the ones older than 65 years of age. So usually they do not work. So someone has to provide for them. And I think it's so obvious that a good portion of this answer must be to integrate them into our labor force. And just to remember one other thing, you said freedom of movement inside European, European Union. This is interesting because I think this is more the discussion in the United Kingdom. People are actually moving inside European Union, but this is actually movements outside of the European <coughs> Union. I think there's very little debate in Sweden about people coming from Poland or Lithuania or Greece or so on. Uh, we have more discussion locked to the world, uh, the global migration, which I think will increase. And that's, I think, also where you should have the discussion in the United Kingdom. I know that this has been very much linked to the Polish migration, Lithuanian migration here in the UK. But the big question is the source of migration coming from so many of dysfunctional states surrounding Europe. To follow up on that question, do you think the concern then if it is about migration coming from regions outside of Europe, actually about the practicalities of being able to support these people uh, and the social services in Sweden, or is it a deeper problem of intolerance based on their origins? Well, we have never been able to show that there is anything that you could call a social tourism or something like that. Uh, people uh, are able to come to Sweden and they want to have a job. Um, and they faced regulations that we have put on the, on the labor market, not them. Um, and of course, uh, we think that uh, we learned that we need to reshape our structures and increase the job, op job opportunities. And we have been doing so in Sweden. We have the most liberal labor regulation laws for immigrants throughout the world since 2008 in all of the OSD. And this has worked quite well. A large portion of the increase of employment in Sweden is now related to um, foreign-born people coming to Sweden to work. And this is increasing our growth. This is actually making our public finances more sustainable. Uh, this is partly the solution we need when, when I, these demographical changes are um, happening. So again, it it's of course links very much to what you do. Also when it calls to these benefits, well, they are also possible to sh re change or change your, your own regulations on what kind of benefits you are allowed to have and with what kind of duration. We changed that in Sweden and that made a drop in the numbers of people living on these kind of subsidies and also uh, lowered the cost that we had in the public finances. The gentleman three rows back uh, with the blonde hair. Yes, you sir. Hi, so thank you for coming. 
can I say with respect that I don't think you quite answered the question. Uh, as you'll know, this is a body committed to contestation and um, free debate. And I think in that vein, it really is quite um, apt that Anna should be asking about uh, the public discussion in Sweden. Um, of course, famously, uh, you, together with the moderates, won in 2006 by sort of reshaping the political discussion in Sweden. And um, a lot of us on the right um, had been concerned before that uh, the moderates weren't able to win because their message was too difficult to comprehend. And so the people couldn't really understand. This was a lot of the discussion within the party. Now, um, I think it really is, um, would be interesting to ask you now, um, what do you see, um, or what do you say about the prospects of um, reasoning in the public life? And I guess that's a question about democracy also, um, today and in the future, um, for public discussion that is rational, rationally informed, open, um, about controversial issues in this um, age that we're entering now. What do you see about the prospects of that? If I make myself. Mm. Sort I'm of not clear. sure I understand the question either. Um, What's the question? So, so could you re It's something to do with rational discussion. Yeah. Do you think there's a hope for public reason uh, today? Okay, okay, right. Do you think that. Do you think there's a lack of, of reason and rationality in public discourse about political issues? Is that roughly the. In Sweden, especially. In Sweden, yeah. No. No, I, I don't think is. You could find all. all um, the kinds of discussions, all uh, opinions are open in the air. Um, I must say that uh, with the broadening of the social media you will find also things that we did not hear in the public room that are now voiced. Um, I think that uh, a lot of uh, ideas uh, or more xenophobic right-wing views uh, are very often heard or followed now in Sweden that were not the case 10, 15 years ago. So absolutely, I think you have a, an open discussion and I think there is a respect in democracy that there could be differences in opinion, but does, uh, it does not mean that everyone has to adapt to everyone else. I could still have strong beliefs even if it differs from the ones voicing things that might be in the short term even popular, but the idea is that some of us do not believe this and we are willing to fight against. That's democracy. Um, so uh, I, I think if your notion is trying to say that things are not allowed to say or to be discussed, I think that's absolutely not true for Sweden now. I think the only thing discussed in Sweden nearly is migration. <laughs> Uh, and I think there should be a lot of other things that we, we need to discuss, to be honest. Perhaps a less abstract question. Um, <laughs> the, uh, the lady about eight rows back in the centre, in the back section. Hi. Um, my, my partner's Swedish. Um, I spent quite a lot of time in Sweden over the last year. Um, I've had a lot of my preconceptions about Sweden challenged quite significantly over that time. Um, the main one um, being about drugs. Um, the thing that surprised me the most is that my pre preconception of Sweden being a particularly socially liberal country has been challenged by the fact that I can't even have a discussion about drugs, uh, or even alcohol actually, with her family. Um, now with the tide very much changing in both socially and in legislation, in the United States, in Canada, Uruguay, Mexico, and very much with the tide of public opinion changing in the UK, do you think that there will be a time soon for Sweden to open up? Um, well, again, this discussion I've heard for 30 years um, about uh, people trying to say that we should have a more open drug discussion, very often meaning everyone should be able to use more drugs. Um, and uh, this, of course, comes in conflict with the kind, uh, very restrictive view in Sweden, which is correct, as you said, um, when it comes to alcohol and especially narcotics. Um, I think, um, and I want to be clear on that, uh, it's not a, a good idea of society to try 
to increase or even give the notion that um, we don't care if you use more drugs, um, then you are, have never been a parent, never. If you think it's just fun to have some more narcotics into society and that everyone should be able to try and then we get a little bit more, you know, good society, uh, well, then I think you need to reconsider. And I think that um, uh, we should allow, as we do in Sweden, um, alcohol, um, but we should have restrictions because this causes a lot of social problem. It's um, a very clear um, point linking to crime, to uh, abuse of women um, that we see uh, related to alcohol. And when it comes to narcotics, it's even clearer. So, uh, to trying to be restrictive, we are trying to save young people from making the wrong choices and to go down, uh, to bring themselves down in um, abusive use of um, narcotic, uh, especially. So, I would defend it. Um, we are defending the, this view in Sweden, and therefore, you're correctly stating that this is different, probably, from some other countries. The gentleman in the back row, in the front hand section, in the green top. Thank you. I'd just like to ask, would you possibly be able to find time for a little chat with David Cameron or Nigel Farage? Because I think the right wing of British politics could probably learn a lot from you. Thank you. I, th I think that stands without any comment. <laughs> Thank you. You're already quite good mates with him. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, you are. Yeah. Um, the lady in, this, in the third row back in the front section. Thank you. Um, so you argued earlier that uh, an open society should not um, discriminate by religious or political views, and I would agree with you totally on that. But uh, for the formation of an open society, surely there should be some common values in order for us to come together to create that society. And I would argue... Um, how we should distinguish, given that we can't, that there are uh, physical problems, you mentioned the schools and education systems, for taking uh, unlimited free movement of people, how would you prioritise people according to what values that they'd uh, need to join your common society? Well, um, of course I agree that there are good values that we should um, form a society out from. And, and, uh, but you should take care that they might change. Um, they might uh, develop in our time. I remember when we um, made possible 1994 and I was one of the two only members of my parliamentary group that voted in favor of a registration for homosexuals. And everyone said, well, that's the only thing we will give them. No more. Uh, and I, as a prime minister, made possible for them to marry. And I think that this shows that a value is important, but it can change. And sometimes a political leader must know when the time is to make the move. Um, so and that's, that's possible to actually do inside a democracy to have this open discussion, what kind of values do we want to cherish? What kind of values is important over time, but what kind of values also needs to reshape? And I'm, I know I'm in Oxford now, and people have told me that a tradition in Oxford is from 13th century, and new things are from the 18th century. So I, I understand that mentioning tradition is a little bit tough in these circumstances, but Still, even in this uh, extremely fine city and in these circumstances, you sometimes need to say, yes, we want to cherish values, but we could also have a discussion to reshape them. And I think the combination is very important. Um, firstly, as a citizen of your neighboring country, Finland, where earlier this year, the new government decided to include our Svara Demokraterna, the true Finns, into government, uh, I would like to thank you for your more principled stance and not letting the Swedish Democrats hijack the conversation on immigration. 
Um, now, I think we would agree on the need for an open society and an open Europe. And at the same time, I think we would also agree that we want Britain to remain at the heart of that Europe. Now, given what David Cameron has laid out in his demands for renegotiations, those two goals seem mutually incompatible to a large extent. And I was wondering where you would, how you would define the trade-off and how far you think um, countries in favor of European integration should go in order to accommodate Britain without letting go um, of an idea of an open society? Um, well, I think that um, David was very clear in, for instance, that he thinks this notion of an ever closer union does not apply to Britain. And I was still in the European Council when we actually reflected in our summit conclusions to say that we accept that it's not a notion for everyone. It should not be a view of an ever closer union. There could be a, a different structures, which there already are. Um, the United Kingdom is not part of the Euro, will probably not be in the future. The United Kingdom is not part of Schengen, so we have to show our passports to come into Britain. Um, okay, Th this I think is, is absolutely acceptable. Um, and as you know, also Sweden has taken the decision to be outside of the Euro. Um, it's tougher when it comes to uh, freedom of movement because that's at the core of the ideas of uh, open borders inside European Union. Um, and it, it especially um, shows annoy some annoyance from Eastern European countries trying for so long to become accepted as part of European Union, fighting their political lives to come in, to now hear that there will be maybe some barriers still for the people to move freely. But that is of course a discussion for, for British leadership to take um, and I'm not certain where they will end up at the, at, the, at the end. There's a lot of discussions at the moment on how to stop people inside Europe <laughs> when it comes to migration. But I want to say one thing. The, the final decision in your referendum, if it's next year or 2017, cannot be on a negotiation result coming from Brussels. The question you must ask yourself is, how much are you willing to lose as a country in influence, in future, in economy, by voting yourself out of the European Union? It's, it's not them out there, the Europeans, giving you an offer. Um, it's, it's your self-interest. It's, it's actually being part of this uh, very interesting um, cooperation trying to solve cross-border problems that we have had for so long um, in, on this continent. And I'm very sure that if you were to vote yourself out, you will find yourself in a situation where you very shortly after would like to ask for all the things to remain, open borders, uh, still be able to trade, still be able, being able to cope with all other Europeans and you will find yourself in a Norwegian situation where Europeans will say, well, then you have to pay and you will have to follow the decisions taken by others. So, highly costly for UK, follow regulations that you cannot influence. How can you vote for that? David Cameron is the leader of a very divided party on the issue of the EU. And in fact, the party's officially said it's going to be neutral in the referendum as a bloc. Uh, he's also a personal friend of yours. So knowing him so well, at what stage do you think he will join the dialogue in a personal capacity about Europe, we all presume, arguing to stay inside the EU, and in what ways will he contribute? Well, I have the deepest respect for David, and he's um, Prime Minister of the United Kingdom, and I will not solve and try to solve his um, dilemmas. He's an excellent politician and a very nice human being, so he will uh, find the way, I'm, I'm certain. Um, he won clearly the elections to the surprise of many um, in, the, in the spring, uh, and I think that gave him a very strong mandate for him and for the Conservative Party to um, um, show the way forward for the United Kingdom, and it's his and the party's decision how they should 
put themselves in this referendum. But at, at the end of the day, I hope that someone is speaking in favor of staying inside the European Union, um, because it will have a huge effect on your lives and, and on, on, on this very fine country. And I think this notion that I've heard from some debating in the United Kingdom say, well, we can solve that later, or we can vote ourselves out and then we'll see, there's probably no problem and nothing will happen. And I will just warn you that that's not true. This has a major impact that will reshape a lot of the circumstances for the United Kingdom. So take this very seriously uh, before you vote. We'll be hearing more about uh, Mr Cameron's surprise victory tomorrow evening from a gentleman called Linton Crosby yeah. in this very chamber. Um, further questions. The uh, hand at the back of this front section on the very end, yes. As someone who presided over the signing of the Treaty of Lisbon, what do you think has been, I suppose, the most successful or the, le or the least successful sort of part of this particular iteration of the EU, and what do you see as its long-term future, slash what would you like it to be in the future? <laughs> well, that's a huge question. Um, the Lisbon Treaty came out of the idea that we should formulate a constitution for Europe, which uh, was um, rejected in referendums in France and Netherlands. And uh, it was taken aback a notion that it could not be a constitution of Europe, it should be a treaty that uh, alongside with the idea of um, a single market also came um, political convictions that cross-border problems could not just be met with market conditions but also some political will or political muscles. For instance, we have a budget inside European Union uh, where uh, I think today 17 or 18 of the European Union member countries are net recipients of the budget. There are a lot of resources given to poor um, people, poor parts of Europe, trying to get their economy to grow stronger. And I've defended this in Sweden, even though Sweden, like United Kingdom, is one of the 11 net contributors to the budget. So it's not just a market. It's also an idea of creating an ever stronger Europe, also for those parts that are economically very weak. This, of course, was clearly increased or you know, more clear inside the Lisbon Treaty. But it also made one other thing very clear, and that's uh, that European Union is linked to its member states. It's owned by its member states. It, it's not a, you know, um, some kind of corporation up in the air on itself. Uh, we can control it. We therefore uh, also made clear that um, the, the national parliaments should have a say, and we still have a discussion if they, we should increase those powers, which I have supported, with national parliaments towards commission proposals, for instance. And I think that was um, a good thing with, with, the, uh, with the Lisbon Treaty. Um, the one thing that we have discussed very much is, of course, the formation of this Eurozone uh, cooperation that has been deepening and this has been worrying me as a Swedish Prime Minister because we are outside of the Eurozone and I don't want a, a, a division of powers and I don't want the future of European Union to be dealt with only at the table of the Eurozone leaders. That's why I think United Kingdom should stay in as I've stated before and that's a risk I think. It should be a square for all 28 members, even there, if they are inside or outside of the Euro, and that has not been finally solved. We've got time for one final question. Um, the lady in the scarf in the third row back. First of all, thank you very much for coming and having an interesting speech. Um, you spoke a lot about job opportunities, so I was wondering what you think about the six-hour working day. <laughs> We, um, I, I just want to say this idea that uh, prime ministers from before come to another country and tell them what to do, I'm, I'm a little bit reluctant. Um, there are clear differences in the job creation throughout Europe. I mentioned Germany, for instance. They have 
mini jobs in Germany that have, I think they have 7.5 million mini jobs at a salary of 400 uh, euros per month. Um, that would not be accepted in Sweden. But it has given a job to a lot of people. You have s similarities to this in UK, which are not accepted and not uh, present in Sweden. Um, there are historical reasons, there are differences. Um, as I said, there are some conditions for low paid work that could be debated, and I'm not sure that they, uh, and I'm, I'm, I'm very certain it shouldn't be accepted at any cost. Or, uh, you need regulations on working hours, you need uh, a salary that you actually live from, and, you know, that reflects the cost of living in that society. And I think, because we have also been accused in Sweden of wanting to lower the salaries of people, and I always said, no, you, don't, you shouldn't do that. It's better to increase salaries, but what you could do is that you could reduce the cost of the employers by giving special rebates or take down the, uh, the, the uh, social um, fees we have taken from the employers. You don't need to take a lower salary on the employee. So I think there are ways around this because of course there's a cost argument, of course. But you could solve it another way, I think related to our Swedish experience. But then again, uh, countries are different and um, you should also acknowledge that uh, United Kingdom, together with Sweden and uh, one or two other countries, are the only ones who have really had a sharp rise in employment in the latest years. It's very impressive in UK now, uh, from two, uh, tw 2010 and onwards. That's extremely important. If you create more employment, you will get more job opportunities and you will actually push back the kind of people that are in this shadow uh, part of society, as I mentioned, and which, if we don't do this, will be the breeding ground for everything that you hate. Terrorists, religious um, people going out against the open society. It happens in the kind of atmosphere where you feel that you are totally outside of society. Um, so that's why I think it's so important to show my commitment to job opportunities and how to solve that. I'm afraid that's all we have time for. I know there are a lot more questions in the chamber and Mr. Reinfeld has graciously ac accepted our offer of coming to the bar after the talk. <laughs> so please come and follow us in and you can ask all your questions. Uh, please remain seated as we leave the hall and would you join me in thanking Mr. Reinfeld. <laughs>